Hi, everyone. I, I know there's still a few folks trickling in, but we're going to go ahead and get underway, and folks can just kind of find seats as they, as they can. Um, hi, welcome to uh, Workbench, Managing Content Management. Um, my name is George Demet. Uh, I'm the uh, founder and CEO of Palantir.net, um, and this is uh, Ken Rickard. He's one of our uh, senior engineers and technical leads at uh, Palantir, and we're here today to talk about Workbench for Drupal 7. Uh, so, yeah, before, I'll let you go ahead. <laughs> yeah, before, before we talk about Workbench, talk about ourselves a little bit. George said he, yeah, he's the CEO um, and the founder of Palantir. I, I have a little more complicated role, um, and my wife is quite the social butterfly, so I find myself at a lot of cocktail parties and people are being polite and they ask, what do you do? And I finally boil it down to a one sentence answer and I say, oh, I work for a company and we build websites for institutional nonprofits. Right, which is a good answer, but I think it's really only kind of part of the full answer. Uh, we definitely uh, we do a lot of work with uh, institutional nonprofits, that would be uh, higher education folks like colleges, universities. Uh, we do a lot of work uh, with uh, museums, cultural institutions, media organizations. Uh, we work with corporations. I mean, essentially, uh, it, we do a lot of work with folks whose org charts might look like that. Very large, very complicated uh, org charts. And um, so I'm going to start off by telling the story of a couple of different clients, um, uh, basically, essentially, for whom uh, the first version of uh, Workbench was actually built. Um, and the first one of those clients is uh, Barnard College in New York. And um, they're one of the Seven Sisters Colleges there. Um, and they had uh, a few challenges when they, when they came to us uh, to redo their web presence. Uh, it's an enterprise level Drupal 7 implementation. Um, so they, um, we were working, they had an electronic communications department uh, that was kind of responsible for the content uh, and administration of their website. An IT department was responsible for the infrastructure behind their website. 50 different academic departments and programs. Uh, 30 what they call section owners, people who are responsible in some way for the content on some section of their website. Um, and actually two, a couple hundred folks who were responsible for directly editing uh, content directly on their website. So that's uh, kind of example number one. This is uh, the site we ended up building for them. Um, example number two uh, is the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago. Uh, this photo uh, is from the um, DrupalCon Chicago from the opening night party we had in the main hall there. They, they're also, um, they're an organization that, that had their own set of um, challenges that they were looking to, to solve with their new web presence. Um, the Field Museum, in addition to being a place where visitors can kind of go and uh, you know see exhibitions and works in their collection, they're they're one of the leading natural history museums in the world. But they're also a, a major research institution, and so they actually have hundreds of different scientists and researchers who are spread across dozens of departments. Uh, their website has uh, just massive amounts of content and digital assets. Part of the project was actually tying into their digital asset management system, which had uh, you know literally millions of items in the collection, um, but like many insti large institutions, it was a very small centralized web staff. So the issue, of course, is that when folks wanted to update content on the website, there was this bottleneck uh, that they were dealing with. This is the uh, the website again, Drupal Seven that we ended up building for them. So, in talking about these kinds of uh, institutions and organizations, we see some common challenges. Um, access and permissions, that you have uh, people who need to be able to edit content on the site by section, not just by content type, which is kind of Dr Drupal's default MO. Um, and hierarchical permission inheritance, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, extensible workflow states, uh, things going from draft 
being edited, published, a single repository for media management, and the ability to modify published content without it going live immediately. That you might have a page that is published on the site, somebody might need to make edits to it, those edits would need to be reviewed before uh, they are put live. And, and I should ask, how many of you are new to Drupal in this room? Okay, Dr Drupal by default only has published and not published. So if you want to make an edit, you, you end up taking the, the content offline. Um, or you just edit live, which is always dangerous. It's scary. Yeah. So uh, talking a little bit about that idea of the content sections, uh, this is a, kind of an example, a, a sample example of what you might have uh, in a museum setting, for example. You might have uh, folks who are responsible for you know, the collection. You might have folks who are responsible for the library. You might have somebody who's responsible for um, you know, editorial content, however, that spans different sections of the site hierarchy. So there you might have somebody who's responsible for both the gift shop and the library section, for example. So what we often see is that content uh, editing and content um, uh, publishing privileges are not necessarily, um, do not necessarily correspond to the uh, information hierarchy of the website. What we also see is uh, different levels of hierarchical access. So you might have somebody who's kind of at the top who's responsible for everything under a particular uh, branch uh, of, of the hierarchy, but you might also have folks uh, underneath that who are just responsible for specific sections, or you might have somebody who's responsible for uh, content in one area, um, responsible for content in another area, um, that the person at the top is not necessarily part of. So it, there's a, there's a, uh, it's the ability to basically identify the different editorial groups uh, within your site. Right, we have, we, you know, raise your hand if this sounds common. We had a, a, a lot of cases in Drupal 6 where we'd have people say things like, well, I have an intern who's responsible for post publishing information to visitors to the gift shop and only that information. Right. And we don't want them to even know that there's other content in the CMS, right? I saw one hand go up. Okay. <laughs> See? Speech. Yeah. Okay. So this is the kind of scenario that, that we're seeing over and over again. And in fact, I'll, I'll say as a developer, it got really tired of trying to solve um, over and over again. So there, with these questions and problems comes kind of an implicit set of client expectations, which are and assumptions, which are often unstated. Um, you know, so some of the issues we have to deal with are, of course, you know, the Drupal learning curve, uh, that, that uh, in many cases, the folks who are responsible for maintaining and editing content on the site are not familiar with Drupal at all. Um, they're not interested in learning more about Drupal. They really just want to edit the content on the site. And specifically, they want to edit their content. They're really only interested in seeing and dealing with the content that is their responsibility and, you know, as Ken was saying, don't want to or shouldn't even in many cases be aware of content that they're not directly responsible for. Uh, they want content to be able to be reviewed before publications, uh, before it's published. Um, they want, um, again, as we said before, uh, content that's live on the site to be able to be reviewed before it's changed. Uh, there's an assumption that uh, media is, should be treated the same way as any other kind of content is treated, right? Whether it's images or video files or whatever. And a lot of these uh, assumptions and expectations come from the fact that, well, that's the way our old CMS did it. Uh, so, but it's not the way that Drupal does it. Uh, you know, so we see these things and, uh, you know, we all know, right, hey, Drupal can do everything, right? There's, there's a module for that, right, Ken? And that's how you sell it, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. So, so as a developer, I mean, I'd say that these unstated assumptions can really bite you if you're not careful. This idea that, what, what do you mean? After you've delivered a project that you've spent, you know, six months on and someone says, well, what do you mean I can't preview the, the change that I just made without it going live to the world? Um, 
because a lot of people come out of a system that published flat HTML files. Um, so yeah, the typical response when, when sales manager George goes out and says, oh sure, we can do this, you just go, oh well, we can use a module for that. And some of the features and functions that I'm gonna show you in the Workbench, workbench uh, demo, you're gonna go, well wait, doesn't X module do that and doesn't Y module do that? And there was, a, there was an issue posted in the queue last week where someone said, well, why don't you just integrate with these other things? Um, to which I responded by posting this document. This is the original punch list of features for Workbench. Um, we're gonna get into the sort of technical part of the conversation now and then I'll do the demo. But we actually did this presentation for the first time at DrupalCon San Francisco before Drupal 7 was even out. And what we basically did is we went through the common scenarios that our clients were faced with every single time we did a site build. And this is actually not the entire list because it won't fit on the screen at a readable size, right? And this is me mapping actual features to actual modules that existed in Drupal 6, some of which we had to write in order to get them to work. Um, I think the final count is 28 separate modules. So number one, you have to have the knowledge of those 28 modules and how they work and how they fit together. But one of the other really big challenges that drives people crazy when they implement a Drupal site is that these 28 modules might have 14 different names for the same thing, right? We use the term section to describe an area of the website that someone can edit. Um, that might be called a context in some other module. It might be called, you know, um, a widget in a, in a third module. These kind of things really plague Drupal um, and make for a lot of complexity. So we wanted this functionality and we, we really wanted to do two things as developers when we looked at Workbench. Number one, we wanted to stop solving the same problems over and over again. Right, and number two, we wanted to try to simplify the interfaces that were being presented to the end user. Right? So this is a very instructive list to me. Um, and some of this stuff still exists in Drupal 7 and is integrated into Workbench. And we'll talk about that when it comes up. So Workbench at its core has three modules. There's a fourth that's, that's really in the works that I'll talk about. Um, the three fundamental pieces are Workbench Access, which is about partitioning sections of your site so that certain people can edit them and certain people cannot. Um, it also will partition where content can be created, um, and that's a very, very useful feature for a lot of folks. Um, and we'll talk about that in some great detail because I wrote it and I can talk about it. Um, Workbench Files, which is um, really at, at sort of a very nascent stage right now and is about providing better file management tools. Um, we're actually also in very, very active div dis, um, discussion, active development on the media module, um, which has a lot of integration points with what we're doing. Um, Workbench Files is really just a view into your file system um, designed to make your, your editor's jobs easier. And then Workbench Moderation, which is the piece that lets you um, set up workflow states uh, that says, you know, this piece of content has to go this editorial review process before it gets on the site. And we'll take a look at all of these. Um, in just a second, because you folks want to see a demo, I assume, a pretty safe assumption. I am going to actually start this demo. I have logged into a Drupal 7 site as a user um, called Librarian, okay? Now, the librarian, one might expect, is it responsible for the library section of the hypothetical website that George was showing you. And in fact, when you install Workbench, it will ask you if you'd like to install its test hierarchy so you can play around with it without having to know how to configure it. It'll just do it for you and install the exact hierarchy that George was showing with the fake museum website. So this is a user who's actually pretty low powered. Uh, this user can create certain content and, cre and can edit content that falls within the library's scope of influence, that, that library section. And the first thing you'll notice is we've got the uh, the toolbar at the top, and they have access to a My Workbench screen. And this is the screen that, that Dries showed this morning, except there's no fancy picture of George. There's the picture of me as a grumpy Viking. He really uh, should have gone with the Viking, I think. I like the grumpy. It's, it's too low res. This is what happens, by the way, when you force me to pose for a picture. Right. And so the idea here is that we want to give people very quick access to the things that they care about. Um, all of this is actually powered by views. 
and we just add tabs to things. Um, you can actually extend this very, very quickly as a site builder by adding another views tab. Um, we did a project that um, George talked about this morning, the, Minis the uh, Minnesota Public Radio Archive, that has another tab that lets them view their content imports to make sure there were no errors during the import process. But the idea here is that everything is right here at your fingertips. And, and I really like this, hey, here are the three most current things that I've edited, right? Um, the idea being you have a workflow um, and we want to get you straight to it, right? So you log in, you come in here, and you can look at um, uh, a page that will show you everything you've ever edited on the site, right? which is kind of useful. Um, you can look at uh, all the recent content, and this is kind of interesting, this is all the recent content that this editor can see. And in a minute, I'll show you the, ad, the admin super user, and I have a lot more authority than that. Um, and you can see that some of this stuff is tagged as it's in the library section, and some is tagged as it's in the library staff, which is a subsection. Right? And this, one of these things that people always have wanted in Drupal, um, you can search and sort and filter the content that you have access to very, very easily. You can even, and I love this feature actually, um, you can say, hey, let's check up on the people responsible for the staff section of the library part of the website. Let's see what they've been doing, right? Really useful. Um, the Create Content tab is here. There's nothing very exciting going on here, obviously. Um, what we actually did, I didn't enable it. I, I'll turn it on in a minute, or, or this user doesn't have permissions. Um, this screen in, in Drupal core is not extensible. It means you can't add new things to it. In, in Workbench, you can. So we add a media link here that says, hey, I, yeah, I want to add media. Um, I have a patch in to add the block link to say, I want to create a new block. Um, we're still debating about whether or not that goes in. Um, you also have access here to a list of all files. This is all Workbench files actually does right now. But it's better than what you have otherwise, which is sort of nothing. Um, just a searchable file list where you can preview everything that's going on. Um, this, this tab is actually a little controversial. This just lets the editor see what parts of the website they're responsible for. And if you have better permissions, fuller permissions, you can actually change these settings, uh, but this user can't. Um, and then there are two things that are here, provided here by the Workbench moderation tool. One is my drafts, and my drafts are things that are not live on the website. They're the stuff I'm currently working on, right? And a lot of people in their workflow, this is where they would come to first, right? Because you want to come in and say, oh yeah, I do need to finish that article, don't I? Um, you can also see there in the left rail, one of these is a draft and the other is a, needs review. The basic workflow is that if it's a draft, it's just for you to work on. But once you think it's ready, you can pop it into the needs review queue and the needs review queue is over here. And what's really, really useful, I mean, just imagine this scenario, right? How many of you, by the way, work in a large organization? And how many of you also have underlings? Right? A couple. Darn. You should get some underlings. They're fun. I love underlings. So, so we'll say, for example, that you are the chairman of the Department of Mathematics at Cambridge, right? That's prestigious. You don't have time to spend writing the content for the Department of Mathematics website, but it's partitioned into five different groups and you've got five different editors who are responsible for making sure that the university's mathematics website is up to date and proper. Well, you can come right here to the needs review tab and check up on your staff, right? And for those of you who've ever built university websites, that's what they want, <laughs> right? Um, that's exactly what they want. The, the uh, chair of the department doesn't want anything to do with the actual content production, but they want to come like a laser beam and right to one point where they can see that things are getting done. Um, and there's some other stuff that we can build in later that's really interesting. Um, we'll look very quickly at um, content creation, which is fun, in part because you can see right, well, you can't see real well, but right there we have the sections box. Um, which allows the user to assign uh, this particular article that we're about to create to one or more editorial sections. Um, and of course, notice that in our mock-up, we have the entire museum, but this user only has access to three things. 
right? Because it's a library editor, right? So when you're creating something, it's front and center, and you can say, okay, that's, that's where this content belongs, right? Let me go back. So let's look at drafts. Oh, it went there. This is another interesting and potentially controversial element that we've, we've put in. Um, there's some folks in this room, hi Bruno, uh, who helped us on this, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about the user experience to this thing. Um, so this is a draft article that I have, and, and we did a couple of things because we wanted to make it really, really clear to the editor what was going on. So the first two things I wanna point out is we changed the names of the tabs <laughs> dynamically based on the actual workflow state of the article you're looking at, right? If this were a live article, this would say view published, right? Uh, but we have view draft, edit draft, which is very different, right? And I'll show you a published article in a second. Um, there's a moderate tab, and that moderate tab shows you the entire editorial history of something. Um, and then we have this little info box, which is actually a Drupal block, and you can put it anywhere you want to on the site. Uh, we actually stole this UX pattern from uh, the documentation section of Drupal.org. Thanks, Bruno. Um, and it's designed to give you just a uh, pinpoint view of the current state of this thing. Because imagine that you're an editor, and you're the editor of um, the exhibit section, right? And you think you should be able to edit this thing, but you can't. Well, if you come in and you have the proper permissions, it'll say very clearly, workbench access, library, and you'll go, oh, yeah, I'm in the exhibits section. I better call the librarian and ask for access to this thing, right? Um, kind of useful. Yeah, the revision state, also good to know. Um, is it current, right? Because when you do revisions, uh, they can get kind of complicated. You can actually have um, a live draft that is not the current version, because uh, that would mean there are other new revisions waiting to be looked at. So we tell you that right here. And there's actually a shortcut for super users that will let you moderate something straight from this page. Uh, this user doesn't actually have permission to do any of that. And we will have plenty of time for questions, by the way. This is a pretty straightforward article. There is no great moderation history on it. Uh, but we even color code things. This is sort of a nice reddish pink to let you know that it's not actually live. Uh, let me find another article. Yeah, new exhibits for May. We have a tab change, view published, but that's all I have authority to do as this user because this is not in one of my sections, right? So one of the things that, that my colleague Colleen Carroll likes to say is one of the things we've done here is as an editor, we've moved Drupal out of your way, right? Um, how many of you train your clients on how to use the sites you build? Yeah, how long does it take you to explain how to create a new page or how to find content to edit? You know, you have to go here and click this and find this. Um, Workbench, for me personally, has turned three hours of training into 20 minutes because I just go, oh, hey, log in, click that. And they're like, oh, how does this, oh! And it's much more intuitive for them. Um, and it's really a lot of fun, actually, to do that training now. So um, we will hold the questions for later. I'm gonna change browsers and show you some stuff under the hood as an admin user. Uh, hey, Firefox, no. Are we at version 27 yet? Right, that was version six they want me to install. Oh, you're so. way behind. Yeah. Um, so here's, um, this is an interesting case. So this is an article that I wrote when I was at Drupal Camp Stockholm, showing off this very same thing. But we're not at Stockholm anymore, so we're gonna wanna change that. And you'll notice the tabs across the top, you know, view published, new draft, very clearly telling me, oh, by the way, if you try to edit this, it's gonna go back into revision, right? Um, and then the moderate, and well, DVL's just there because I forgot to turn it off. Um, so if we go in and, oh, well, let's look at the moderation history of this thing. No, nope, there's nothing exciting there. Just thought I'd check. Um, we want to change this. We want to change this. Say DrupalCon London Pub Crawl. Oh, I can't type. Pib. 
Pub crawl. Not actually going. Yeah, yeah, I'm tired and jet lagged and stuff. Um, now, what's interesting as a super user, uh, for people familiar with Drupal, normally in the publishing options you have a, a yes no checkbox basically that says this is published or this is not published. Um, for most of your normal users, they won't have access to this moderation state. Um, and with Workbench moderation, and I'll show you, you can actually control, just like I can control which section someone has access to, you can control which states they can move things to and from. This user can actually override all that, um, because it's user one, and move everything straight into production if I care, choose to. But by default, if I create uh, a new page, uh, hey, I'm on the view draft tab now, right? Very clearly telling me, oh, that's the DrupalCon London pub crawl, and let's make sure this worked correctly. Oh, that's the version that your site visitors are going to see. This is the version that's still in cache, right? If you're using something like uh, Varnish or Akamai or a front edge, front side cache, that's the still live cached version, um, which is really, really helpful. And if I go in here to the moderate tab now, Oh, look, you clearly tell me what's going on. Um, so let's look at moderation just a little bit. Um, for the developers in the room, I, I will pseudo apologize for this. Uh, Workbench moderation is actually a fork of the content moderation module from Drupal 6. Uh, it was forked because that developer wasn't ready to work on Drupal 7, and we had a deadline to hit. Um, there's also a revisioning module for Drupal 7 that, that has many of the same features and I think can be used as a drop-in replacement, but we haven't fully tested it. Um, and it's just one of those cases of people on different deadlines not quite communicating as well as they might. Um, this actually allows you to, to create and manage different workflow states. Uh, they are linear workflow states. Uh, the idea being, you know, you want to move it through a process. Right. And it is a, like I say, a, a linear process. Um, and it's kind of nice because you can name, well, you can't name them yet, but you can give them different descriptions. Um, you can add new states if you choose to. Uh, you can remove states, uh, which is kind of interesting. And you can also define the transitions that can be performed, right? Because again, this is a linear process. Um, it doesn't make much sense to move something from published back to draft. You, you could do that if you want. And these transitions are important because when it comes to configuring, and I'll show you. Open new tab. When it comes to configuring the permissions for things, do, do, do. Workbench moderation gives you very, very specific access controls to what people can do. So on a per role basis, you can say, yes, they can perform this workflow transformation, this state transformation, or not, which is really, really useful. Um, exciting. You can also set different default moderation states for different content types. So you can set it up such that blogs, blog posts always auto-publish and don't have to go through moderation. But you know, articles do have to go through a moderation process. And that's really, really useful. And then workbench moderation can be a little complicated. So uh, Beck White, uh, who's one of our engineers, built this little permissions checker that's designed to help you understand if you've got it configured properly. I don't exactly know how it works, but I'll double check. But essentially it says, hey, does the editor role do what I think they should be able to do? Um, can they edit moderated content of the article type? Uh, the editor role should be a qualified editor. Do, 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 do. So yes, this one passed the check. Um, there's some UX work to be done here, but this is actually a really helpful feature when you're setting up the site because the moderation can get really complicated and hard to debug. So uh, the second part that I will show you is the access control part. So Workbench Access is an interesting beast. It tries to 
replace some things that we did in Drupal 6 and sort of expand on some things that other folks have tried. Uh, the first thing to know is that it's a pluggable system. It's designed to be an API kind of system. And it can use any hierarchical system that you might think of. Uh, by default, right now, it supports the menu system and the taxonomy system that Drupal uses. Um, but there's, I'm actually working on a patch that supports the role system, just because it's kind of fun. Um, and those systems don't even have to be hierarchical. They can just be, they can be flat lists if you want them to be. Um, but theoretically, you could do like group-based, organic group-based access control through workbench access if you chose to. It would be a little strange, but you could do it. And here on the configuration screen, we have a couple of options. Um, you can choose to use one or more of your, your vocabularies. Uh, you, you have to select at least one. Um, this is what George was talking about earlier. It's divorced. Potentially, your access controls can be divorced from your site architecture. Um, typically, they are, but they might not always be. So this allows for that. Um, there's a nice new feature that we added here uh, that allows you to say, you know what, I don't want this to be enforced on these content types, uh, which is also very, very useful. Um, because by default, Drupal users, you'll have permissions like, I can edit all articles, right? Well, if Workbench Access is turned on, if that article's not in your section, you can't do that, right? So we might just choose to say, you know what, blog posts, we don't care about blog posts. We're not going to put them under access control. Um, and that's pretty slick. There are two other things down here, well, three. Um, we talked about section a little bit. I like to call them sections. Other people don't. So we just made it configurable. You can call it whatever you want. Um, that's, yeah, I know, it's kind of silly. Uh, these last two are, are not quite so silly. Um, these are fun. Uh, Automated section assignment, uh, enable all sections automatically for the active access scheme. What that means is, um, hey, make this entire taxonomy part of the hierarchy. Right? And in most cases, in 95% of all cases, that's what you want. Right? But take, this, take the following case. Um, so back at the University of Cambridge, right? Is it the University of Cambridge or is it Oxford University at Cambridge or are those two separate things? Separate. They're two separate things? Okay. So let's say that the physics department really wants this kind of hierarchical control, right? And they've got subunits for astrophysics and whatever other kind of physics there is. And the math department just doesn't care. In that case, you might not want this because the, your taxonomy might let the math department tag things as, um, you know, uh, statistics versus um, number theory, uh, whereas your, your physics department has, you know, physics and theoretical physics and astrophysics and applied physics. Um, you could turn this off and say, you know what, we're going to select which ones matter. Um, and I'll show you the interface for that in a second. Um, and then there's allow multiple section assignments. Having multiple section assignments can actually um, complicate things for some folks. In fact, when we were building Barnard, they explicitly asked not to have that feature um, because it makes it easier for people to step on each other, right? Because if the library can edit it and the exhibits can edit it, then who really owns it? So it's now just configurable. So um, if you turn this off, instead of getting a multi-select box, you'll get a single select box which is a useful little feature. Uh, I'm actually going to, hey, look, I get an, an alert. Are you missing a meeting right now? Yeah, I'm missing a, a, a meeting. That's right. I'm going to turn the automated section assignment piece off. I'll also note that if you, if you have automated section assignment turned on and you add a new taxonomy, taxonomy term, it'll automatically get added in. Um, if it's turned on, these, these things are not configurable anymore. It still shows, uh, but this is showing me the hierarchy that I have, and it just lets me turn these things on, on and off, which is, again, I think really, really useful. The other thing that's really useful, let's look at the editors first, is that there are two fundamental ways that you might assign people editorial rights. Um, and they're, yeah, anyway. Not going to jump ahead on that. Um, this is the overview that talks about 
editors, that is individual user accounts who have access to certain sections. And so we get this little overview that lets me know that what, there's one editor for the museum section, there's one editor for the library section, and I should have made more, more users, but I didn't bother. Um, and if you go in here and we look at what's under the library, it's as we might expect, the librarian. You can remove the librarian, that's kind of useful, or I can add a new person, and I think there's an editor in here, and it's just a little autocomplete text field. So now I have two user-based editors, right? And so when, when an individual user's access rules are being checked, we, we look in, a, you know, in the data and we find this. Now, imagine that you have 1,200 people on your staff. You probably don't want to have to administer this for the 80 sections of your website. Um, and if that's what you don't want, we also have role-based assignments which is usually what people end up using, right? Because then you can just make a role that says, this is an intern. Interns belong to these sections, right? And I did set up, oh, look, a role to be the museum editor. Um, same basic concept, right? The thing that you should note, though, is that let's say George is an editor and a user. If I say all editors are members of the museum section, he has access. But if I can also say that George has access to the museum section, right? If I take away the editor's permissions, George still has permission because he's assigned as an individual user. Um, the reason that you have both of these things, most people say, well, role-based is enough. That's, that's fine. It's really for the exceptions in the organization because you have that one secretary for some reason who's responsible for the physics department and the English department. Yeah, and the whatever spun off from the English department when they split it into, you know, uh, classics versus, yeah, anyway. We're not going to foment academic dissent in my, I'll stop. Uh, <laughs> so there's the basics. And if I go in here to my workbench as this editor, I can show you, hey, look, I can look at my sections and I can assign them. I can also, as an editor, I can go look at other people's accounts, my contributor here, and oh look, there's a little tab and we can see, oh, what sections is this person assigned to? Oh, they're not assigned to anything, um, that's why this is collapsed. Oh look, I can go in and say, oh, this person should be part of this group. Um, kind of a nice little feature. Um, I will point out, by the way, that workbench access and workbench moderation do not require each other, and in fact, don't even require workbench, the main module. You can actually run them as standalone independent things. Um, I don't really recommend it um, because it goes to what we've been trying to accomplish. Uh, every single client that we launch on Drupal 7, and we've done eight or nine so far, at least. Launched? Launched. Six or seven? Yeah. A lot. There's, there's we're working on a lot. <laughs> We're working on a lot. Every single one of our clients gets this every single time. There's not even a debate. Um, and what's nice about it for us is it's like a one-hour budget item in the overall project. Because instead of having to go find 28 different modules and configure them, there's four. And we just go get them and we configure them. So um, that's pretty exciting to me um, as a developer and as a, as a site builder. Um, so it's really about changing the way we interact with Drupal. Uh, that's, I think, the big thing here. Um, the other point that I would try to make, I think I just forgot, because I'm being spontaneous. Darn it. That happens sometimes. <sighs> so, let's go back here. New exhibits for May. My test article. Yeah, this is a, a more detailed, <laughs> yeah, I tested this a lot. And you can go back and, and look at any of these and say, you know, this is the one that I liked. I want to make this the live one, and that's good. So let me go back to, to slides for a second and make sure I hit all the points I wanted to hit. So Dries was really nice, and, and actually every time we go and we show this off, people get kind of excited. Um, I get excited when I show it off. I'm kind of proud of it. Um, I should say that there have been at least eight people involved so far. Um, it has really been a big team effort. Um, at San Francisco, we had a big pizza dinner with all the engineers, and we hacked out our, our list of features. And 
the previous times we've been giving these presentations, it's been a little bit as a, as a sales pitch to get people excited and get them to use it and to say, this is a good idea. And hey, look at the cool features we have that we're still working on. Um, from an engineering standpoint, I would say it's feature complete. There's some stuff we'd like to work on. There's some extra stuff we could do, but it's ready, right? It's, it's ready for use. It's, I know it's a beta nine, but we're expecting the 1.0 release within the next two weeks or so. There's like a half dozen sticky little bugs we have to fix, but they're all edge cases, but we still have to fix them. Um, then there'll be a, 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 a stable release. But it's, in terms of functionality, I think we're fine. Um, but what everyone says is, especially with the, the, the overall views and things, they go, you know, it's still a little ugly. A little, little rough around the edges. It's a little rough, and that's true. Um, and part of that is because, I, I, can I say this? We, we started the project with a UX lead, who then decided not to move to Chicago and moved to Vancouver instead, and he quit. So, um, so we lost our UX guy. But we just hired a new one. And this is what he did his first week on the job. Patrick Grady is our new, new UX uh, uh, designer. And he said, you know what? He, he doesn't know anything about Drupal either. Nothing. His first exposure to Drupal was somebody installed Drupal 7 for him, put Workbench on it, and said, make this easier to use. These are sketches from his first week. Right? Um, the other thing that's really, really exciting to me, and I'll show you, he wants to um, redo, the to redo the toolbar. He thinks the toolbar is too complicated. He wants to put like personalized contextual links in the in the toolbar, right? So that people can just add their own stuff. And as engineers, we went, oh yeah, flag module will do that for you. Sure, we can give you that in like a week. Just tell us what it should look like. Um, so we're really excited about the work that Patrick's doing. At the same time, in the last three weeks, we had two different companies who don't even work with us. Um, one of them say a company here in the UK whose name I forget. And they said, hey, we're using this stuff. And we think it's pretty awesome, but we have some ideas for how it might be more awesome. And we have 10 work days we can devote to development. <laughs> what would you like us to focus on? Yeah, snickering. No one ever of volunteer help. Yay. And then, and then a friend of mine who's actually doing work at Al Jazeera right now, he called me up and he said, um, we're about to undertake this very large project. And Mark Bolton. You guys know who Mark Bolton is? Yeah, he did the seven theme and the Drupal.org redesign. He's a big UX designer, a big designer, he's a big famous name. Well, Mark's going to be designing the Al Jazeera project, apparently. And the guy wanted to know if Mark found problems in the, the workbench UX, would we be receptive to hearing about it? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> So um, rather than be sort of developer focused from now on and say, hey, what new features and things do we want? My actual plea at DrupalCon um, London is to say, all right, we think it's ready. We think it's good. Um, we think some of it should go into Drupal 8. But we know we need some, some spit polish on it. We need um, a little bit of not eye candy, that's not even the right word, but we need to know where the problems right. are. Right. I mean, fundamentally, the system is designed so that, you know, very basic content contributors and users can easily do their jobs on the site. So the system really does need to be easy to use. Yeah. And so you can post issues in the queue if you want. There are actually some issues in the queue. I, I'll say there are some technical issues in the queue, and then I'll, I'll talk about a few of them, that are literally waiting for someone to design a user interface for them. Because we know how to solve the technical problem, but we don't know how to solve the interface problem. Uh, because that's not what some of us do. But that's what we got Patrick for. We're working on it. I know we're working on it. Um, I will give you a little bit of feature roadmap. Uh, one of the things that Workbench Access does not do and I blame the, for, the field API for this, is that it doesn't actually interact with native form elements, which means it actually creates its own form element. And so you should know going in that if you use it with the menu system, for example, it doesn't actually add pages to your menu. It doesn't do that. It just reads the hierarchy that you're using. Um, so it's, it sits in parallel to it. And for those of you who care, on Wednesday, I'll be having a core conversation um, I can't remember when, 
Um, and we'll talk about why that's the case and why it makes me very angry. Um, one of the things that needs UX work are these next two, access rules per content type and moderation rules by content type. Really nice features that people would love to see, right? The, the idea that, hey, this intern can only edit blog posts in the mathematics section. The problem is the user interface pattern for how you manage that is a freaking nightmare, right? Um, I could give you an ocean of permissions checkboxes, right? But if you have 10 content types and 40 sections, it's gonna get, I'm not giving you 400 checkboxes without some usability work. Um, this idea of editing the default states, you know, renaming them, adding new ones, uh, removing them, that's good. Scheduled state transitions, this one's close. This is a fascinating one. Uh, the idea that you can say, hey, on, if someone creates a new, new draft on Monday, if it hasn't been touched in three days, move it into a, hey, jerk queue, or what, what would you call it? The, the speak now or forever hold your peace queue. Yeah, the, all right, nobody reviewed it, I'm gonna make it go live queue, right, right. I like that, because then, then someone could log in, and of course, if we, if we have um, you know, notifications, sort of emails that go out, you know, we could send a notice, hey, editor of the mathematics department, there's a piece of content on your section that's been sitting for three days. You need to look at it. That'd be kind of nice. Um, and I have, we do have clients who really want that feature. We have a client who wants an automated message to go out every 180 days to say, hey, dummy, look at this page. Make sure it's still accurate. Every 180 days. So scheduled state transitions would allow for that. And this other one, we, we have another great guy on our, on our team, uh, Steve Persh, who's an engineer. And his first day on the job, when we, we showed him Workbench, and he got excited. And we're like, so what do you think we ought to do? And he goes to this one, nonlinear approval workflows. Well, what the heck is that? Right now, we sort of walk things through draft, needs review, published. He goes, no, 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 that's too much. What you really need is little, little approval checkboxes. We know the thing is ready to go live. But we're a big, you know, we're, we're Cambridge, right? We're important, and if we get something wrong, that's a real problem. So our lawyer has to review it, and our PR person has to review it, and our technical reviewer has to, has to approve it, and our style editor has to approve it. Right, and in no particular order. In no particular order, and without actually saying there's been a change to the content structure. So what he wants to do is these nonlinear approvals that just say, oh, hey, you're looking at this as the legal reviewer. Do you approve it? Check. Right. So um, I think that's really exciting, actually. So exciting, I really want to write it, but I'm going to let Steve do it. A um, couple of others, um, assigned reviewers. Um, this is actually a pretty big one. I have a client right now who desperately wants this. They want to be able to say, yeah, hey, I just wrote a new draft. It needs review, and I need this person to look at it. All right, so that's a good one. Um, scheduled content publication. Uh, this is actually an ongoing problem. The scheduler module is awesome. The scheduler module doesn't understand revisions. It never has, it probably never will. So we're fixing that one right now, actually. Um, notifications is actually pretty easy to do, this sort of workflow notifications. There's actions and triggers and things we can do for that. And then better file and asset management. You'll notice I didn't actually show you any of the media integration because it's not quite done. Um, I will urge you to check the issue queue. One, one of the interesting things here is we made a strategic decision um, as a business and as developers, uh, unlike some similar kind of products, I mean, it's not something that we sell. It's not a distribution. Uh, we've talked about making one, um, but it's really about making everyone's lives easier and we really want to contribute back. As I said, we think some of this stuff will get into Drupal 8 um, core, uh, and I think that's, I think that's going to happen, actually. Um, but it's not a distribution. It's not something that you go and you get. Um, and at the same time, it's not one giant chunk of modules. It's five different modules that you have to go download, and they each have their own issue queues. So if you really care about content moderation, there's an issue queue for that on Drupal.org. Um, and I encourage you to go check those out because it's community stuff. I mean, we want people to participate. We want to hear from you in the issue queues, especially if you're a designer. We love designers. They make our jobs easier. Um, I'll take a sketch on a napkin. Seriously. Anything. Um, so 
for more info and questions, and we're going to have we have some time for Q&A. Yeah. Uh, we do. Uh, that's the the project homepage. Um, these three folks, Robin Barry is one of our engineers. She is sort of the tech lead. She stitches it all together and sort of says yes and no on new feature development. Uh, Colleen Carroll is sort of our customer advocate and uh, is leading the design process. Uh, I'm one of the engineers and, and I'm pretty visible, so it's easy to find. Um, and then there's George. And George asked you not to ping him in our IRC. I, I, I won't see that, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> George doesn't hang out in IRC, but I'm in Drupal Contribute all day long. So um, we have, by my watch, nine minutes left. All right, so yeah, if anyone has any questions, I think we have a mic we can pass around. We do. So we have a volunteer to. Hopefully the second mic is turned on. It should be. Yep. Okay, excellent. So uh, there's somebody. Okay, yeah. Just take it. I'll, I'll let you decide. If, if if folks raise their hands, just 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 give it to them. <laughs> Let's torture the volunteer. Yeah. Right. Um, I just wanted to know. Uh, I saw um, you had the, the page where you showed the source of uh, the hierarchy tree, mm -hmm. um, and it was like a radio button, meaning that you could only pick one. Yes. How hard would it be to have multiple sources for the hierarchy? Because assumption yeah. that you would only uh, base your uh, access control or uh, on the menu tree or a taxonomy tree might not be always valid. There's an issue for that in the queue. Oh. <laughs> My initial response to it is, yeah, that's awfully complicated and I urge you not to try that. Um, the, there's, there's actually an architecture problem because uh, it never occurred to me to let you do that. So you can't do it right now and it would take, it would take not a ton of effort, but it would take some effort to allow for that. Um, for me, conceptually, it doesn't make sense, actually, to, to, because it's not one hierarchy anymore. The nice thing about menus and taxonomies is they, they have a terminus point, right? There's a top level. Um, one of the nice things, by the way, Workbench Access, unlike other things, will actually let you select the top level menu item, or menu, or the top level t vocabulary as a section, right? Um, it's not limited to just the children, right? But if you had that, you'd have to create a, a sort of false top level, and then you'd have like, well, here's your menu stuff, and here's your taxonomy. It would be weird. So. Next question. Hi. Hi, nice module. Um, do you have internationalization or multilingual support? There's no sort of special international support. Um, there's just sort of default Drupal 7 support. I'm not sure what else there would be exactly. I mean... Like the internationalization module, the third party module? Well, I mean, you can use inter internationalization with it. Um, I don't think there's anything special we need to do. If, if there are features like internet, you know, Panels for people who are doing translation, that makes a lot of sense. Um, but I'm not sure, at the moment, I don't really understand the question. Oh, you know, the way, I, if you only want to moderate the English content, the easy way to do that is to just edit the views that come with the module and just add it in. Right. As a, maybe a bit of explanation, if sure. you have an English, French, and German version of content, somebody modifies the original English one, it would be very nice to flag the French and the German one mm -hmm. to be reviewed as well. And yeah, and it, there's a mechanism for that in Drupal core, but it's not reliable, is that it? Or do you have to do it manually? Because you control the states on the nodes, you could as well modify the, the states on the translated nodes. Right, I see what you're saying. Yep, yep. And automatically create, well, you, but you don't have a new revision of the translated nodes. You'd, you'd sort of want to have another state. You'd, you'd want to have another state that says, hey, translation updated. Exactly. Yeah. That, 
I can see how some of that sort of stuff might work. One, one, it's funny because one of the things we ask for frequently, if you, went, if you went to post that in the issue queue, we might have a conversation very much like that in the issue queue where it's like, well, what do you mean? It supports multi-language, but teasing out what that feature actually means. Um, yeah, that makes perfect sense. I can see a module that all it does is add a new moderation state called you know, translation check or something like that. And what does it do? It watches the translations of nodes and if you modify the German version, it marks the other two. It says, hey, we're going to make a new draft that needs a translation check pointing back to, that wouldn't be that hard. You mentioned that the module was operating on nodes and files, but is there a way to use it to, uh, for just about any uh, custom entity that a crew a site could uh, use? Not at the moment. Um, the question was, if you didn't hear it, uh, we, we're, we have support for files and we have support for nodes. Do we have support for any type of entity? And the answer is no, um, largely because most people don't interact with those sorts of things. Um, so by default, we don't support that. Um, again, one of the nice things that the views modules enables is that you could add another tab for that very, very easily. So if you need to say, hey, I, I want someone to be able to have an overview of users who are assigned to their section, that would be pretty easy to add. But we don't do that by default, um, I think, simply because most people don't want to look at that stuff. In fact, for most of our editors, we want to, we want to keep them away from that, that kind of thing. And there's, there's someone a couple okay, rows up um, here. So I have a question. Uh, let's assume we have the sports se section of uh, a website. This is a problem we're facing. And we have a very big editorial team, uh, one team that is editing the web version of the site. And Drupal is also serving a mobile version of the site. And the sports section appears in, in both versions of the site. And for several reasons, we don't want to make a sports mobile section and a sports web section. Uh, web section. We want to have that same. Could you split up the permissions so the sports mobile team can have their own permissions versions versus to the web web sports team? You you Does can. That that's a, it's that's a complicated question. It depends on how you're splitting the mobile site out. Um, in the Barnard case, Barnard actually uses domain access, which is another module that I maintain, to split content across its departments. And they, they literally have domain access and workbench access separating stuff for them, um, which is really kind of interesting. So you could do it something like that. Um, in your case, you might need um, a separate piece. You might need an, another additional thing. It's, it's a little complicated in that case. It would depend on, on again, how, yeah, how you're splitting out mobile versus non-mobile. Hi. Um, so I have a client at the moment that wants to review multiple pages in graphs at the same time before they're all switched to the live site. So they want to make changes to the, the content and the layout and review them all to make sure the whole kind of package works well. At the moment, from what I can tell, you can only review one page in draft at a time because as soon as you then follow a link it goes to the current live version of the, the linked page rather than the draft one that you really want to see. Is there, is there anything in Content Workbench that helps solve that problem? There is nothing in Workbench that will solve that problem. That's actually a pretty nasty problem to solve but I could tell you how to do it using views bulk operations in a, in, in <laughs> you could do it. It's, that's one of those, that's one of those problems that I would put squarely in the category of I want a UX designer to even to look at that before I even try to write a line of code because if you if you approach that in the wrong way it's going to be absolutely unusable you can you can do it I mean views bulk operations supports that kind of thing I, I have a piece that we wrote for um, the Minnesota Public Radio archive they, they imported a bunch of data from a legacy system and they can literally go in with views bulk operations and pick like 20 stories and look at the title and the body text at the same time and rewrite the headlines for like 20 stories at a time and save them all at once. Um, and doing it for individual fields like that is actually really easy and there is a UX pattern for that. Um, but if they want to view the entire thing, that's a little harder. Uh, so I've got two quick questions, or maybe not quick question, but two questions. Um, the first is, uh, does Workbench allow for syndication of content across different sections? 
And then the second question is, I know that media isn't very far along, but what's the state of workbench and media now and the kind of roadmap for that? If, if you want to take the first, I'll take the second. Exactly. Yes, you can syndicate something across several sections. You, uh, by default, you can assign a story to more than one section, just like you could assign something to more than one taxonomy term. So yes, you can syndicate something to multiple places. And the, the warning I put on that is that it might confuse some of your editors. Um, so some of our clients don't want that. So that's actually configurable, whether or not you can send it to multiple places. Right. And uh, so with regard to media, um, you know, as Ken mentioned earlier, we've been uh, really, really involved in, in working uh, on media and in the media issue queue. Um, and uh, it's, I think, not quite official yet or officially announced yet, but I, I would expect to hear uh, about an upcoming sprint, um, you know, where we're working to get uh, media to a stable release for Drupal 7, um, you know, precisely so that it can, um, among other things, um, integrate uh, much more closely uh, with uh, Workbench. So, um, Ken's put up the uh, feedback slide. Um, so, um, this is something, um, I, I was uh, one of the chairs at uh, DrupalCon Chicago, and um, both as a presenter and uh, as a DrupalCon chair, um, s having great session feedback uh, for past DrupalCons is really, really helpful and important. Um, my understanding um, is that the, the actual links on the sessions uh, for submitting feedback, um, um, they might not be live yet, but I know that they're working on that today and that those links uh, will be live soon. Um, so once they are, please um, go to the DrupalCon website, uh, find our session, please submit your uh, you know, evaluation and feedback uh, for us. It's a really great um, and valuable tool. And uh, thank you very much.